Hello, my name is Turner Overton. I'm the medical director of the 1917 HIV clinic at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate uh, in the conference and particularly thank them for their patience with me as I work through this COVID pandemic to prepare my slides. Uh, it's been really a challenge um, this year and I'm delighted to be talking about uh, HIV rather than COVID at this conference. Uh, I certainly hope that they'll invite me back uh, and next time I'll be able to come in person. Today I'm going to focus on cardiovascular comorbidities in the setting of HIV. Here's a brief outline of the things I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to focus a little on the changing HIV epidemiology that we're all aware of. Um, pivot briefly to talk about obesity and its complications and potentially its role uh, in cardiovascular disease. And then talk about how cardiovascular di disease is unique in the setting of HIV and what we need to do uh, to prevent these complications. Here's some data from uh, the Kaiser Permanente group that really focuses on the increasing life expectancy of people living with HIV. And here they have about 39,000 individuals in the uh, Kaiser Permanente group, and they match them one to 10 with people who are uninfected with HIV to look at the change in um, life expectancy for people over the last 20 years of the HIV epidemic. And if you look at the top, you can see that for people um, without HIV in the blue, life expectancy has been relatively stable over the last 20 years. Whereas people with HIV, we've seen a striking in increase in uh, life expectancy uh, where people with HIV now are approaching uh, the same life expectancy of people with HIV. There's a clear narrowing of the survival gap. Uh, now it's only nine years shorter for people with HIV than those without HIV. And while that is still a gap, it really shows the striking increases that have occurred over the last 20 years. Unfortunately, what we see <clears throat> as well is that uh, a, a period without any comorbidities, particularly cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, kidney disease, or lung disease, uh, remains much shorter with those living with HIV, such that um, in 2000, um, you know, it was only 10 years till someone with HIV was expected to have another comorbidity versus nearly 30 years in people without. And this, this disparity has remained over this last 20 years and really speaks to a challenge that we have among our patients. Now, one other piece of data that came out of this, um, this analysis was even people with a CD4 count greater than 500 at time of entry into HIV care have a reduced life expectancy when compared to HIV uninfected people. So we still have challenges um, that we need to meet. This isn't the first study to really highlight this disparity in terms of comorbidity. Here's data uh, from um, a Danish cohort where they had both HIV and HIV uninfected people. And if you look at the table on the left or the figure on the left, you can see that for just about every comorbidity that they evaluated, numerically there, there were a greater proportion of people with HIV than without HIV who had these. And a number had a significantly increased uh, risk, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, peripheral artery disease, and chronic kidney disease, all of which clearly have a vascular component to them. And when you look at the table on the right or the figure on the right, you can see that for any age group, uh, um, you can see a greater number of multimorbidity, two or more comorbidities in an individual, which really suggests a, a challenge for us as, as our patients age. Not only are they going to have to address their HIV and remain adherent to their HIV medications, but there's also significant polypharmacy uh, related to these other comorbidities. And so we can actually say that HIV appears to accelerate the prevalence of multimorbidity uh, among people living with HIV. Now, wh why do we see this? A big thing that we see is weight gain with the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Um, early on, we recognized that with the initiation of ART, um, people regained weight, and we initially stated that this was a restitution or a, a return to health phenomenon. But I think we're recognizing more and more now that this doesn't truly uh, represent a restoration of health, uh, but maybe an alteration uh, of health and, and wellness. Um, here in this study, Grace McComsey and others looked at the changes in body composition in individuals who initiate an antiretroviral therapy with either uh, one of the uh, uh, boosted protease inhibitors or with the integrase inhibitor. 
And what you can see here is that for all three of these, there was a striking increase in adiposity, both in terms of visceral adiposity tissue here on the left or subcutaneous adipose tissue, and a striking uh, uh, 4 to 5 percent increase in BMI over a 96 uh, week period. And there was no difference seen between the protease inhibitor based therapy or the integrase uh, uh, based therapy. And I think these data have been borne out, and alarmingly so, in the advanced study that was has been presented over the last couple of years, um, where we see a striking uh, gain in weight in both men and women who are initiating our first-line therapies now, with a disproportionate increase in those who initiate uh, dolutegravir plus TAF, uh, with women uh, gaining on average eight kilograms at 96. Um, weeks. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going over this study except to say this is a phenomenon I think many of us are recognizing is that our patients are starting antiretroviral therapy. They're gaining significant weight um, and much of this weight is uh, adipose tissue and it's being uh, deposited in ectopic locations, locations where it can cause significantly uh, worse disease. So what are some of those consequences that we see? Here's some data that came out from the VA cohort that looked specifically at, at diabetes. And here they compared people with HIV to un HIV uninfected individuals. And what they saw is when people entered care in their system, people with HIV had a lower BMI, 25 versus 28, but they had a striking increase in weight gain uh, with an average of 4.3 versus one pound per year in terms of weight gain. Now furthermore, as these individuals gained weight what was the effect on diabetes? We know that there's a clear correlation between weight gain and incident diabetes, but there was a striking greater increase as people gained weight if they had HIV, really suggesting that there was some additive effect of HIV to the development of diabetes. So an increased diabetes incidence for every pound of weight gain in the setting of HIV. Furthermore, we know as well that uh, obesity can increase the risk of of neurocognitive decline. Here's data from the ACTG A5322 study where they're following older HIV patients uh, uh, longitudinally and what they see here is that clearly age was associated with an increased development of uh, neurocognitive impairment as were uh, uh, overweight and obese individuals. So, so clearly obesity can affect uh, our brain function and our cognition, some of which may be driven by effects on the vasculature to the brain. A third organ that I just want to highlight briefly is the effect of uh, adipose, ectopic adipose tissue in the heart or epicardial adipose tissue. We often don't think about this because we can't see it, but we know that this is a depot for ectopic adipose tissue that's similar to visceral adipose tissue, and it really has uh, some pernicious negative consequences uh, for people who develop uh, significant uh, epicardial fat. Uh, furthermore, we know that this is increased in the setting of HIV. This has been shown by Janet Lowe, uh, even matched for age, race, and BMI. And this significantly contributes to the development of atherogenesis, uh, both by uh, attracting macrophages, which are activated and can form plaques, and also by generating cytokine production, which increases the inflammation in the heart and in the coronary arteries. Finally, not only can this lead to atherosclerosis, but it also can lead to uh, cardiac fibrosis, uh, and progress to uh, heart failure, which is one issue that we're seeing a lot more with our patients. So we also need to recognize that this ectopic fat this ep is, is being deposited not only in tissues that may be normal or healthy, but also in a number of, of places where it is unhealthy and can contribute to disease, including in the heart, which can lead to cardiovascular disease. One final item that I wanted to talk about as we, before we transition to focus on cardiovascular disease is, is physical inactivity um, and the link to obesity and comorbidity. Um, I work with Amanda Willig, a nutritionist in our clinic who also is a researcher, and using the Scenix cohort uh, across the U.S. CFARS, what she has shown is that physical activity is extremely common 
um, and linked to a number of things. Now, first and foremost, it's linked to obesity, and I've already mentioned that. Uh, overall, in this cohort, 35% have obesity, but depending on the level of physical activity, the lower the physical activity has the highest rates of obesity uh, in this cohort. And furthermore, when we look at other comorbidities, and particularly here I'm looking at hypertension and cardiovascular disease, you can see a striking significant increase in these comorbidities in people who have low physical activity and obesity. And furthermore, it's also linked to multimorbidity, which can complicate the care of our patients, as I mentioned earlier, for the management of polypharmacy uh, as well as multimorbidity. So if we pivot now, I think that you recognize that our patients are living longer, uh, but challenged with the face of uh, a growing number of comorbidities and multimorbidity. Let's focus in on cardiovascular disease in the setting of HIV. Virginia Triant at Harvard was one of the first investigators to highlight um, that cardiovascular disease uh, and here myocardial infarction rates are higher among people living with HIV than when compared with HIV negative individuals. Uh, what you can see here in, in this graphic is that there is a 1.75 increased relative risk for people with HIV to have a myocardial infarction compared to people without, without HIV. And when you look at this graph here on the right, you can see there's a striking increase in the risk as you go up in age rate, uh, really suggesting that this is not just an additive effect of HIV, but the longer a person has HIV, it's a synergistic uh, a greater negative impact, really suggesting that something underlying is ongoing that's driving this process uh, beyond just traditional risk factors. Similarly, uh, Matt Feinstein from the NA Accord group has shown that over the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen a striking increase in mortality rate related to cardiovascular disease for people living with HIV. You can see here um, uh, for both men and women, uh, a more than doubling effect of cardiovascular disease in the setting of HIV. Finally, Matt Freiberg uh, used the VA cohort to look again at the role of HIV in the development of myocardial infarction. And, and what you can see, once again, is the incident rate ratio for acute myocardial infarction is pretty stable from 1.3 to 2.2 increased uh, incident rate ratio for the setting of HIV. And in their adjusted models, when they looked for other recognized risk factors, what they saw was the impact of HIV was comparable to tr traditional risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, really highlighting the fact that HIV is an independent risk factor uh, for cardiovascular disease. Uh, one final study that I really like because I think it really uh, brings home where we are in terms of the HIV epidemic and thinking about cardiovascular disease as well as other non-AIDS related comorbidities is this study um, from the New York Department of Health and here led by Dr. Hannah uh, where she looked at the changing epidemiology of mortality for people living with HIV. What you can see in the blue at the top is a striking decline in HIV mortality uh, over this period uh, from 2000 to 2012 and a marked increase in, in mortality related to cancers and cardiovascular disease. And specifically when they looked at cardiovascular disease, what they saw was there was a notable increase in cardiovascular disease mortality among people with HIV, an increase from 7% of deaths to 13% of deaths, while there was a decrease in the general population. And the adjusted hazard ratio was 1.54, really suggesting a 54% increased mortality for cardiovascular disease among people with HIV compared to HIV negative individuals, even after adjusting for age, sex, race, ethnicity, location, and year. So once again, a, an increased relative risk compared to the general population, uh, which is really uh, significant. Now, when we look at the population specifically, and this is one of the reasons I really like this study, they looked to see what was the effect of viral suppression. And what you can see is that for individuals who remained virologically suppressed throughout this follow-up, the rate was half of what it was for individuals who had even one elevated viral load, uh, uh, 3.9 uh, uh, 
cases of cardiovascular mortality versus 7.7 .7 per thousand patient years. But what was notable was this remained higher than the background rate in the general population, even for those with fully suppressed uh, HIV, really indicating that we, we have a challenge to face and we need to, to understand what the factors are that are driving excess cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease mortality among our patient population. So why is this? Um, I think, you know, one of the key reasons is um, the underlying chronic low-grade inflammation that we see with HIV. Here's some data from Kevin Yaroshevsky where he did FDG PET imaging of the coronary arteries in people with HIV and matched that um, to people with HIV. In this study, all the HIV, people living with HIV were fully suppressed. Um, and, and what you can see here this is the um, coronary arteries here and here and here. And we looked at many different factors, but this FDG PET imaging allows us to look for metabolically active plaques that are the ones that are more likely to rupture. And they generate these what are called low attenuation plaques that you can see here. And so these are full of oxidized uh, LDL particles and activated macrophages, which become foam cells, which can rupture and form and cause a, an acute myocardial infarction. So you can see these here as well as here. And so HIV patients had increased uh, low attenuation plaques as well as positively remodeled plaques and increased spotty calcification. And all of this is related to vascular inflammation with increased metabolically active macrophages and greater non-calcified metabolically active rupture prone plaques. So once again, these data highlight that there is excess vascular inflammation in the setting of HIV. Uh, now we show this with Dr. Yaroshevsky, and it's also been illustrated by Dr. Uh, Markella Zani at Harvard. So what we know is that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process where you have endothelial smooth mu muscle disruption and then the activation and infiltration of macrophages, oxidized lipid accumulation, and the formulation of these uh, uh, lipid-rich plaques that are easy to rupture and cause a myocardial infarction. In the setting of HIV with greater vascular inflammation, we have even more in metabolically active macrophages and greater non-calcified metabolically active rupture-prone plaque. And so we know that the vascular inflammation associated with HIV is contributing at least to some degree uh, to the uh, acceleration of the formation of these plaques. And this leads us to the inflam inflammation hypothesis. Um, so this really is not novel to HIV. It's, it's in any disease process. So when we are faced as an organism with a pathogenic stimuli, we have a, a, a strategic inflammatory response that occurs driven by interleukins, TNF, TGF-beta. And these are, are, are created to clear whatever that pathogenic stimulus is um, and then return us to some normal state. Now, unfortunately, in some settings, the stimulus can persist, um, and this leads to a pathogenic response with an ongoing inflammation leading to fibrosis, tissue destruction, altered function, and progressive disease. And this is exactly what we see in HIV, where we have chronic, even with the treatment and control of HIV, we still have ongoing uh, antigenemia that can drive this inflammatory process and lead to end organ disease, and here we're talking about cardiovascular. So if we think about the why we have excess cardiovascular disease among people living with HIV, first and foremost, HIV, like most chronic viral infection, induces this persistent low-level inflammation, causes these altered T-cell and monocyte populations, uh, and increased circulating oxidized LDL particles, and increased vascular inflammation, all of which accelerate the formation of atherosclerosis. This, um, this persistent inflammation facilitates the, the development of rupture-prone atherosclerotic plaques. Now, furthermore, we have to remember that for many of our HIV patients, certain traditional risk factors are also enhanced that may be contributing to this disease process. Here's some data from Carrie Alpha from the NA Accord group where she looked at nearly 30,000 people with HIV and 347 adjudicated myocardial infarctions. 
and what you can see is that traditional fixed risk factors plays a significant role in the development of, of myocardial infarction for these individuals. Uh, so we still need to really think about those. Now you can see also uh, advanced HIV disease as well as poorly controlled HIV also contributed. But we can't forget about cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, uh, and other traditional risk factors when we're thinking about treating our patients uh, to prevent myocardial infarction. So we think about non-AIDS comorbidities and specifically cardiovascular disease. They're clearly traditional risk factors that we can address, some of which we can't address like host genetics, but diet, lifestyle, and substance use and tobacco use, which may be increased among our patients, are items that we can address. Furthermore, we know that HIV infection and antiretroviral therapy likely increase. So if we can uh, suppress HIV viremia and try to mitigate some of these effects, we can play a big role. There's still a number of questions for the future. What's the role of HIV, the role of antiretroviral therapy, particularly the weight gain with antiretroviral therapy? Are the effects re reversible? Is early treatment key? Is management different among people with HIV? So statins are an interesting uh, um, class of drugs and are known to reverse atherosclerosis. Here are two studies in the setting of HIV, uh, one by Janet Lowe and one by um, Grace McComsey looking at two different um, statin therapies, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, both of which were shown to reverse uh, atherosclerosis. Here's some imaging you can see from Janet Lowe's atorvastatin study, and this is actually a placebo patient who at baseline and at month 12, you see an increase in this low attenuation plaque. And when we looked at the population, she saw an actually a regression with atorvastatin that was um, beyond what would be expected with just LDL lowering, really suggesting there's some anti-inflammatory uh, effects here. Similarly, Dr. McComsky with her rosuvastatin study showed a stabilization of CIMT, carotid intima media thickness, and showed that this was mediated uh, by a number of inflammatory markers, including uh, monocyte activation markers, really suggesting that this plays a key role in prevention of, of progression. Now, unfortunately, when we think about statins, and here I'm also going to talk about aspirin, um, we as HIV providers fail often to, to optimize these preventive therapies. Um, uh, Dr. Greer Burkholter from my clinic in UAB has looked at this very issue and, and showed that for uh, people with HIV, only 44% of persons with elevated LDL are receiving or reaching their uh, cholesterol goals, and only one in five are receiving an aspirin as primary cardiovascular disease prevention. Um, and if we look at who achieves good reduction with lipid lowering therapy with statin use, uh, only, third, only about a third of people achieve 30% reduction after an MI, and only one in five has 50% reduction in LDL after an MI, really suggesting, well, we may actually start a statin, we may fail to optimize that therapy uh, for our patients. So we have some clinical to overcome, and one of that may be because we have inadequate data. Um, we know that people with HIV uh, uh, are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. We don't know to what degree statins can prevent cardiovascular disease and should be recommended for primary prevention. Um, though well tolerated in small studies, there's no data from large randomized clinical control trials to really inform this. Um, and, and then questions of how statins will uniquely work in HIV, particularly thinking about this inflammatory component that is driving atherosclerosis. So the reprieve study was developed for just this reason, and um, I'm delighted to be a, an investigator on this with uh, the PI, Steve Grinspoon, and, and Pam Douglas, in which we've enrolled over 7,700 patients to be randomized to either patavastatin or placebo um, uh, as primary prevention uh, in HIV patients uh, with low to moderate risk for HIV, including in this study is 800 patients who are involved in a, mecha a mechanistic sub-study that's really going to get to the underpinnings of what is happening with statin therapy. Um, furthermore, this is going to answer questions not just about coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, but also many other endpoints, including inflammatory, immunologic, and metabolic biomarkers, as well as on other AIDS comorbidities like diabetes infections and cancer. And furthermore, we have nearly a thousand individuals from Thailand who are in, enrolled in the study. 
here are the hypotheses of the study. Um, we're really excited to have both a clinical trial but also have a mechanistic substudy that we can look at the, the reasons driving, the underpinnings driving atherosclerosis and HIV. Now, when we think about HIV, really, obviously, suppression of, of HIV is the first thing that we have to think about, not just from an HIV disease standpoint, but for many of these comorbidities. But then we move beyond that. There are many items that we need to be addressing with our patients. Smoking cessation, key lifestyle factors, lipid-lowering therapies, and addressing other traditional risk factors like hypertension and diabetes. I often think about it as the A, B, C, D, E's of cardiovascular disease management. Uh, A for aspen, B, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, exercise, and smoking. We know that if we don't address these issues, then our patients are going to be uh, affected detrimentally uh, by diseases such as cardiovascular disease. So in summary, HIV and its therapy have the potential to contribute to cardiovascular cardiac risk along with the traditional host factors. We know that controlling viral replication partially reduces cardiovascular risk, but our patients still have excess risk. Early antiretroviral therapy may significantly mitigate the uh, HIV-associated cardiovascular ris risk by limiting the amount of inflammation. We don't have reliable inflammatory markers to predict risk among our patients. Uh, and unfortunately, the currently available risk scores fail to accurately estimate cardiovascular risk among our patients with HIV. However, we know that smoking cessation, dietary, and exercise interventions are effective in the setting of HIV and should be aggressively pursued for our patients. Statins may be a benefit in addition to lipid-lowering effects, uh, uh, thinking about the anti-inflammatory effects. However, we need more data to inform this, and Reprieve will hopefully uh, serve this, this process. I want to thank once again the, um, the coordinators of the conference for inviting me to participate. And, and once again, I hope next time to be able to participate in person. Uh, everybody stay well. Bye-bye.